Hi there, I'm your host, Clive Sirkin, and welcome to the Unstuck Podcast, where we're on a journey to help you get control of your work environment, get yourself unstuck, and perform to your full potential. So today's guest, uh, in my mind, re- represents the epitome of unstuck. Um, I'm joined by uh, Tuan, uh, who on the surface of the story is cruising to success. I mean, Tuan has enjoyed a successful career in advertising at, at my old company that I had the joy of working for 17 years, Leo Burnett. He's managing a promising startup, which I want to talk about, Via5. Um, and he is a community activist through his organization, Chicago Peace. Um, the story of how he got here is pretty um, interesting. I don't want to dwell on it. You know, he and I have talked about it. It's, it's less about the story that got him here and more about the impact that's happening in the community today through his business and through his uh, his uh, organization. So, Tuan, welcome. It's 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 an absolute pleasure to have you on the on, on the podcast. I enjoy spending time with you at the coffee shop. Um, but thanks Thank for making so much, time Clive. to come talk. Thanks for having me, Clive. Appreciate it. It's an honor to be here with you. It's a, it, it, you know, it's funny. We met, um, I think Rich Alipak introduced us, but we met a, a while back. And, you know, I don't know your history, um, but just you just struck me as a really interesting, innovative, sort of driven kind of guy. And um, m- many months later, I read the article that Scoop wrote about you. And I'm talking about Scoop Jackson, by the way. If those of you haven't, who don't read Scoop, you need to start reading him immediately. Yes. Unbelievable writer and just a great You're person, fine. as I understand of it. Um, but I was just struck by that story and it just a lot of pieces fell into place with it, but I'm going to quote his opening because I think it sort of nails the story. Um, in the, in the, and as best as I recall, the quote is, he writes, there, he said, this is a story about the sustained sustainability of an individual who in truth, none of you are supposed to be reading about recidivism interrupted a young man who was supposed to disappear once he was behind maximum security walls a story about someone who was supposed to be all types of things, just not what he became. It was interesting to read that because I know the man of what you've become. And so your history for me is an important sort of backdrop of the man you've become, but I'm much more interested in the man you become because of the impact you're having through Viet Five and through Chicago Peace. Um, but if you're okay with it, I want to spend five minutes just talking about, you know, the behind maximum security walls. And as you talk about in the article, prison number 64215, and I I don't want to dwell on that. Um, um, But I think it's interesting, less so interesting, I think it's important to talk about in the sense of people make mistakes, people find themselves in situations and how they deal with it is the difference between um, success and failure, and you are like ridiculously successful in any measure, particularly given that backdrop. So, yeah, you want to talk a little bit about how you became prisoner number six four two one five to the extent that you want to? Yeah, sure. I, I I would even go further. I mean, I'm I'm a refugee uh, from Vietnam. You know, my family and I escaped from Vietnam in 1981 uh, after my dad was incarcerated by the communist government after the fall of Saigon. In 1975, he was uh, incarcerated for about five and a half years. Um, he was re- he was released on a home pass and devised an escape plan um, for for our family. Uh, we were, we were all our property and land was taken by the communist government, so we were essentially mal- malnutrition um, with no medic with no medication. Um, my mom was sick, uh, so it was desperate for my dad to devise an escape plan. Um, there. Uh, my mom was pregnant also at the time. Uh, I was three years old, but he managed to uh, smuggle 55 souls on a small fishing boat, 55, 45 by 15, uh, with 55 souls on board. And I was the youngest. Uh, we spent about five days at sea prior to come to Malaysian oil rig, uh, where we were brought inland. Uh, and from there, um, my dad was interrogated and he happened to remember his service number to the U.S. government because during the war he fought um, on the South Vietnamese Army, but employed by the U.S. government because uh, that, that was our ally um, to infiltrate enemy territory. They were equivalent to the Navy SEAL of, of Vietnam. Uh, he was so he remembered his service number 
Um, and but because of that, we were able to seek asylum to the United States. And I we came over here um, uh, when I was three years old. So growing up in America for me was just a different, um, you know. And, and it wasn't just America. You went to, was it Kansas, Kansas City. Yeah, where? yeah, where, yeah. When we came, we first came to Virginia first. We went to the East Coast of Virginia. And uh, from there, we found out we had family that had escaped earlier than us uh, a few months back that resided in Wichita, Kansas. Wichita, okay. Yeah. And that's how we we first, uh, we hopped a Greyhound from Virginia to um, Wichita, Kansas. And that's where my, my journey kind of began in this, you know, Bible Belt of America. But people didn't like us. You know, we were placed in government housing. Uh, we were placing, you know, the projects of of of, of this small town. Um, but my parents always uh, worked their their tails off, you know, uh, to provide for us. And going to school is where it really starts for me. Is that battleground of going to school? I didn't have a good school experience. I got my first fight in kindergarten. You know, I was expelled in school in the second grade. Um, I eventually, um, left home when I was 12 years old and that cycle for me of decision-making into this, uh, culture, uh, evolving culture for me that it was, uh, I couldn't really understand a lot of the things. Um, but I found camaraderie in other kids, other refugee kids like myself, uh, that dealt with similar circumstances. And of course, you know, that's where gang life started you know, perpetuating and our decision making uh, was not wise at the time. Uh, but we felt that it was the right thing and it got in a lot of fights and things like that. And because it's the early, you know, because it's the mid 80s and 90s, that's the drug epidemic that it plagued our neighborhoods. And of course, because of that, we got into the drug trade as well. Um, and that whole life cycle is, is not only uh, it's violent, you know, it's a it's a violent lifestyle, and that's where at the after my 18th birthday, I um I I shot and killed a young man, um, uh, uh, and I was charged with uh, first degree murder convict uh, charge, and eventually um got convicted and sentenced to a life imprisonment with the eligibility of fi- 15, and that's why how I became inmate um. 64215. It's a number that I will always, that will always be attached to me. You know, uh, if I went, if I commit anything right now and gone back, that's going to be my number. Um, it's going to stick with you for forever. And it's a number that reminds me of who I once was, but not who I am today. And so you're an 18 year old kid and you know, 18, doing, yeah. well, how old? 19. 18. 18 year old kid and you're doing you you're convicted and it's a life sentence with uh, option for parole in 15 right so you so you make a commitment to make the best of what you have right no not at first i was too angry to be afraid at 18 yep no um but because of my lifestyle and my previous juvie stint to the maximum security prison of Lansing, Kansas was a welcoming environment because the guys that I grew up with now are like OGs in their sets, right? They, everyone is recognizing you and, and knowing that, you, you know, we're all kind of, this is like our path, you know, this is like our path and you were welcome into a, a familiar scene, which is sad to say, because, you know, we either be rich doing what we're doing, just like the folks on TV, you know, become kingpins somewhere, living in a big mansion by the ocean, or we die doing what we're doing. And the third option is that we go to prison for the rest of our lives. And a life sentence in the city, in the state of Kansas, meant life imprisonment. And so getting, you know, walking through, you know, for the even for the first time in the maximum security prison, we call it the catwalk. You walk through the yard and there's this narrow pathway of concrete with two, you know, a, a corridor of fences and barbed wires on both sides with your bedroll 
some are frightened or, and some are scared and, and nervous. Um, but I was too too angry to be afraid. I felt like this was what it's supposed to be, my next step. You know, and seeing familiar faces, I began to start imitating the life on the street in prison. I didn't have a, a, a remorseful heart or a change of mind set. It was something now, how do I make this place a uh, home for the rest of my life, but create a, uh, your own narrative and footprint in this space that uh, I, it's so familiar to me. Sad, but it's true. It's, you know? it's sad. And um, I mean, and we've talked about this and the part of the process of getting you to where you are today, which is we're sitting, um, we're sitting two miles apart. You're at the coffee shop. I'm in my office. But part of the process that got you here is sort of being honest and open and truthful about your reality. So you you obviously did time. You get out and you make a decision that you're now going to get out. Uh, and when you get out, you're going to make something of yourself. So yeah, it took. I mean, that psychology of getting out. When you have a life sentence in the state of Kansas, it means life. I didn't have aspirations of freedom. But it took, you know, 10 years into my prison sentence for me to change internally first, though. I really had to make a decision. Um, and it really was a moment for me. And, you know, a, a transformational moment, I guess, that you might, it might not translate to the physical space at the moment because I'm still in prison. But I, I had... Uh, basically overdose inside my cell after we smuggled a bunch of drugs in and it was a bad product, but I had to try it, you know, to make sure that everyone wasn't lying to me, you know? Um, so I had to try it. So I did. And I overdosed in my, my cell. Um, uh, and I almost died in my cell, but fortunately by the grace of God, I woke up the next morning, uh, bloodshot eyes and, you know, vomiting all night. And I just, the next day, I really felt sick to my stomach. Uh, really not a physical sickness when I said sick to my stomach. It was more of realizing that after all these years, I was 27 at the time, uh, going on 28, was that I, look, I would look at the pictures on the walls of my family. My dad, who's, in a, who's a Vietnamese war hero. My mother, who is one of the strongest women on earth and relatives that are now become strangers to me. The influence that I have on like my, my friends or what we call like little homies and stuff like that are, 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 are not good. I've been a destructive force in people around me and destructive force with my own family. My parents had nothing good to really mention about me to any of their peers who and in and in Vietnamese culture there's it's a, a sense deal. of shame and I didn't I didn't bring any goodness to the reputation of my family especially to my dad with his prestigious military record and he's considered a hero among so many but yet he has this son who is a convicted murderer serving a life sentence you risk your life and your whole family's life to bring them to the uh, to America for a better future, the American dream. But yet you have a son who who is now a convicted murderer. They feel a sense of guilt on their end. What's what's happened? But it's really not their fault. They they've done. I left home because I didn't want to bring trouble home. I left home at twelve because I knew the things that I was doing was not good. Though I was twelve years old, you know, yeah, but you know, but you can't get out of it. I couldn't, you know. Yeah, it's like, but it's also hard to under, it's hard for them to grasp why yeah. I get suspended from school and the white kids or the other kids that I fought with go back to school. Yeah. You know, I couldn't understand System. that myself either. And yeah. I, after a while, I, t I stopped telling them why I was suspended from school. So I would snatch the truancy letters or suspension letters from the mail before they get it. And I wandered the streets during my two weeks of suspension. I would steal from the convenience stores. I would steal from the grocery stores to eat during the day. 
And I would make sure, you know, I would still, I would, that's back when, when they had pullouts in cars, you know, I would still just pull out radios and go oh, sell yeah. it and have cash in my pockets. And then the guys that are, you know, all around me, we grow up in the same circumstance. So you all, you know, you start having a following among your peers, you know, so I, that same lifestyle now culminates in a life sentence going on 10 years. I sit there and I have no one to really blame but myself, but also feel a sense of forgetfulness. You know, people can, I'm living a life so easily forgotten and not one worth remembering. And I wanted to change that. I didn't have a moment like a Jesus moment, the light rays through my cell, yep. nothing. But that night I really did pray to a maker. I pray to whoever made this universe, whoever made me outside of my parents, whoever created this world. I didn't know, you know, God, but I just asked for a second chance, you know, to remove me from this stage of incarceration, not the physical incarceration, but my mind. Incarceration of my mental state. Why do I keep making the decisions that I'm making? If someone say something to me outlandish, I respond. If someone looks at me a certain way, I respond. If I don't have money in my pockets, this is what I do for it. You know, and the influence I have on the people around me was just not good. I just, you know, and so I just prayed to be released from my stage of incarceration and to really, I wanted to live a life worth remembering and not one so easily forgotten. Because no one will remember me if I was stuck in that state outside of a convicted murder and, and someone that's failed as a son, as a brother, as a friend. And that's what really happened to me. That's really where I, I wanted to do different. I didn't care because I led my set. I didn't have to ask anybody. I followed no one. You know, I realized, you know what? I don't follow anybody. If I want to do this tomorrow, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And and in my head, that's what I, I I mentally decided to do. And the crazy thing, Clive, I don't know if you ever know this, but two weeks later, literally 14 days later, a guy named Don Raymond from a faith-based program, which is called Interchange Freedom Initiative. Their parent company was Prison Fellowship. He was a director of IFI. To make it short, Interchange Freedom Initiative, he came to interview someone else in the facility, but he was just so curious about this Twan guy who's been writing him, because I've been writing this guy wanting to get into his program because they're in a medium facility, which I couldn't get into. acquire because right. I'm a maximum security. I had the, the gang point on me, uh, which means you never, you can't get custody, different custody levels. Yep. Uh, Permanently. It's a permanent gang point. And, um, but he happened to come in to the facility to interview another guy, but he was just curious who this Twan is, uh, who he dubbed as the disciplinary king of the institution of the can Kansas penal system. I had more disciplinary reports. My first 10, 10 years, I spent seven and a half of those years in solitary confinement or restriction units. You know, that's 23 hours, sometimes 24 hour lockdowns. That's brutal. Um, and I, yeah, I, you know, I got a lot of those times I, I didn't do anything technically to be in segregation, but really just for investigation because of your status in the prison. And, but he came, uh, I was notified, I was in the laundry, working in the laundry, which is the best job for any smuggling operation in the facility. And I would just got a big shipment in. I got a big load in and I um, was distributing it to different uh, facilities. And I, one of my friends came down, we called the street, called, came down the street and then came through the laundry and was like, hey, there's a guy named Don Raymond from IFI. You need to talk to him. He's here to interview you. He's here to meet you. And I'm like, I dropped everything I was doing, Clive. Literally everything I was doing yep. and not knowing that this was my moment, but I just wanted to, there were, it was almost like a, a voice to say, you know, 
there's a hope at the end of the tunnel kind of thing. Yep, yep. But I didn't know what to expect. So I went into the, the D, D cell house where I was at in a max unit. And there was this old white gentleman, you know, white hair. And he's sitting there with his little, little notepad. And I came in. At first, I was a smart, I was smart ass. But I was so, I was like, yo, you, you ain't going to let an Asian in your program? What's up? You know? And he's like, sit down, sit down, sit down, son, sit down. And I did, you know, I sat down. But to make the long story short, one of the things that he had stated to me why he denied me repeatedly was that he couldn't find anything good about me. It's tough to hear. To let me in his program. Yep. And for real, that really resonated with me because he wasn't telling, he, he was being truthful. If anybody looked at me at that time, there wasn't anything good about me. I wouldn't invite that person into my house. I wouldn't even let you ride in the car with me, you know? So he, he wouldn't, you know, he, he was being truthful, but it really resonated with me. But throughout the conversation, he just, at the end of it, you know, he, he really, he, he said, there's just something leading him to give me a chance. And it really, for the first time in my life, someone said they were still going to give me a chance. And even with my parents at that time, right, they expected me to either go to jail or die. I, you know, even the girlfriends that I had, they didn't really expect much out of me. Even some of my, my guys that are around me, the highest we'll probably go is, you know, what we're doing already. You know, we got the status in jail, in prison. No one's messing with us. We got amazing racket that's bringing in thousands of dollars, you know, every week. And you, you're at the pinnacle of what you're doing, you know, and no one's really given me a chance until he said, I'm going to give you a chance, man. I leaned forward as fast as I could, you know, and, and say, help me get out of here. You know, yep. he told me, he promised me another two weeks. He'll work on getting my meat, my medium custody by exception. And he did that, Clyde, you know, and two weeks later, man, I, I was accepted to go into the program, which means I, I would go from the maximum to the medium facility. And I dropped everything that I was doing. Um, right off the bat. And it changed the whole course of my entire life. And, and I, I, first of all, I, I, I really appreciate the transparency and the honesty, but it's an important story to hear in the sense that, and we can keep talking about it, you decide where we want to go, but there's a fast forward to this because you've committed yourself because of that to help other people. And in that story was like the thing that touched sort of a nerve for me when you were talking about, because I haven't heard you tell that part of the story, but the notion was the first time, first of all, the system is set up to take you down this path in a way it reinforces the journey you're going down. And the second part is, there's no one really says to you, I'm going to give you another way out. And I, and I have other expectations of you. And so I'm going to jump forward. We can go backwards, but now you have this organization called Chicago peace, right? Yeah. And a big part of that is to provide a similar, not for same situation, but for people to prevent them from going down this, this, this path. Yeah. Um, and, and have expectations of them and show them possibilities and not just in a sort of conceptual way, but real tangible, here's a job, here's an opportunity, here's the support. Talk talk about Chicago Peace and, and, and the mission and what you're trying to do and how you're doing it, because I think it's incredibly powerful and I'd love to get more people involved in it with you. Yeah, absolutely. I think with Chicago Peace is, um, you know, our model is that we exist to create positive generational impact. And with the focus on families, because I, I, from my experience growing up and also experience around with my friends and in the community that I currently live in, is that all these things are generationally. It's, it's not, you know, and parallel that is systemically, right? It's systematic. Uh, it runs parallel with this generational impact that's negative impact that's happening in our communities. Um, the, the why is that an Asian guy? from Vietnam would care about things that's happening in, um, you know, in, in the neighborhoods in, of Chicago because it's so familiar with, to me. 
you know, Chicago Peace, it, it stands for, a peace stands for partnership, education, the arts, compassion, and enterprise. And I believe in this, those five areas is, is how we could help uh, reshape and reimagine the way we serve our communities and our family and the families that are within it. You know, the partnerships is that we didn't, I'm not coming in, we're not coming into, um, with, into the city to say that we have to solve for all those things. But there's been community, communities, organizers, and organizations that's been in this city since the day of Dr. King that's, that's been serving our, our city, our great city. And, and that's one thing that I know that is, is the fabric of Chicago to me is the community organization of, of movements and service. Man, it's, I've never been in a city that's like that. There are so many organizations, churches, that wants to serve and give to their communities, you know? And, and so there's, there's a gap there of why it's the, and then you see all the violence that's talked about there's, and then the families that are affected by it. So the partnership is huge for me. Everything that I'm doing is through a partnership. Even though we conceptualize something on our own, I seek out partners to come along side. You know, I, I don't want to do this thing by our, ourselves. We just doing a softball game to raise school supplies. I could do that easily for by ourselves, but we partner with Blackhawks Foundation. You know, we partner with Target. We partner with a local retail shop here. You know, we partner with a restaurant to donate burgers because it's not just by ourselves that we want to do this small thing because I do dream big, but I want to take little steps to reach those goals. You know, and it has to be education too. The educational part is through mentorship. You know, developing a mentorship program that allows people to walk side by side, a life on life. But it, I don't want it to be someone just come in and out of the, the the young people's lives. But I also want to include the family as part of this mentorship. You know, the parents, the nucleus. You know, uh, uh, that surrounds these young people in in our city. Sometimes it's broken in the homes, right? You know, with single family moms and, and or just the infrastructure of the home. But how do we now, you know, guide and be in, invest into uh, a family that's on this block? If we can nurture and invest and, and educate and love our one family on one block, imagine the impact that you can make in that community. You know, it's, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to have ability to mentor the entire neighborhood Right or provide service for an entire neighborhood, but how do we on a hyper local level, on a human level, to be able to do that through education? And the arts is is where I where I'm able to you know influence a lot because art saved my life, and through the creative outlet you know through workshops, you know to create access throughout. Now we have Vit Five, our space transform into those things. You know we can provide access where I can bring in our agency friends. I can bring into my artists, you know, artists that are established, creatives that are in are in the midst of their in the heights of their careers. Now get to op- open up the doors to bring our young people from the south and west side of the city to meet, you know, and guide and provide that guidance, and then do you know our art installations is great. Although you know we've done a few of them around the city and things like that, but we do them in schools, you know. So now the schools get to see it, the students get to be a part of it. The faculty is energized in what that is. And I believe those are the, the, the small steps to lead to a larger generational impact. And then the compassion part is the, I feel like it's the easy, the low hanging fruit for us, right? We do it two, three times a month where we provide services to uh, neighborhoods around the city. We've done it in, in numerous, um, multiple neighborhoods around the city in the last year and a half, particularly in COVID, during the COVID season. We've given uh, you know over half a million pounds of food, you know, Health and health uh, um, checkups and, and things like that, um, like backpacks for school and you know food. But that's really, it's a given. You know, we should be able to be able to provide those things that we can. To not say later on, you know, we can do it now. Let's do it right. now, right? And then the enterprise part is the part that I'm still working to build. And with you know, with friends like you, will help me even more. So, and I'm doing it to create this this uh, proof of concept with Vid Five is to create the, the, the ownership, to, to teach about entrepreneurship, how to go from a concept to actually a business, you know, to go from renting to owning, to go from borrowing to investing, 
you know, to to just change the mindset and psychology that's been infested in our neighborhoods and and our families because I, I don't want them to be debilitated by the lack of fear that they can't own something that they don't have to you know I, I work this with my guy Dion all the time is that well I pay you this amount force yourself to save this amount a rich guy once told me I was like how do you get rich he says I save what I have and I don't spend more than what I have and I'm like, oh, that's it's easy enough. It makes sense. Right. You know, I want to be able to do that for myself as well. You know, I want to well, save and invest. And that's such a crucial thing for me. And I was thinking about it when I was driving home from the last time I came over for coffee. You know, and again, we jumped fast forward, but your yeah, art yeah. led you to your career in advertising. And you had a great career in Leo Burnett and that. And so that opened all doors. But and then you have peace, which is about opening doors for people in the community and showing them a different way and supporting them through that. And it's not a one-time deal, but it's being there with them, walking with them and bringing partners in to do that. But now you have, and, and by the way, this is Twan, the husband of Anna and the father of, of two gorgeous daughters, right? So you're a family man too. And so you're yes. thinking about creating a generational legacy for your family. And so Absolutely. the notion of creating Viet 5, which is a four, so you got Peace, which is a nonprofit, but you got Viet 5 is a business. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's a brand of coffee, which I want to talk about. No, it's the first time I'm embarrassed, but it's the first time I've had Vietnamese coffee. I'm growing <laughs> as a man. Um, but it's a, it's a brand of coffee and it's the coffee shop itself in you bring people from peace into the shop and give them jobs and careers. But it's also an incredibly powerful proof point that someone from the community can create their business. And you're learning as you go. I mean, you are like a sponge. I, I can see every time you talk to someone, you, you're you like, man, you, you, it's like you're sucking it all in and growing and building along the way. But it's a, I, I would imagine if, if I'm in the community and I've, I'm involved with you through peace. I also can see not just your story of where you got from where you were to where you are today. I see you moving forward and building a business. So tell tell us about Viet Five and how it came about and what you're trying to do with it as a business. In addition to just, I shouldn't say to just, in addition to providing jobs for people in the community. No, that's great. Um, yeah, thank, I'm glad that Viet Five was your first cup of enemies coffee. I'm a, it's a it's an honor. It was damn um, good too. Yeah, I the the coffee journey for me started um, for my family started in 1975 after the fall of Saigon, right? We were displaced. My family, my mom's side, was displaced to the Central Highlands. Um, so they've had this coffee for I mean throughout my whole life. Oh, sweet. don't worry. Okay, I got to move around a little bit. The lights went for, the, for everyone's when the lights went out in Twan's place, but we can still hear you. <laughs> no, it's security lights. I'm sorry about that. No but, worries. Uh, they, they've had this coffee for a while. Um, but in 2019, I visit for the first time since I left Vietnam at three years old. I went back in 2019 to visit my family and uh, discovered that we had this coffee. Later on that year, I started importing it. You know, I started importing it. I started importing it immediately and uh, uh, started coming into like a, a profile, uh, you know, to, to develop a profile of the coffee that's still, you know, uh, original to how I drank it in Vietnam, how my mom taught me since I was a kid, and share our story. You know, it's really important part was that I wanted to really share the resiliency, not only of my family, but the Vietnamese people. So Viet Five really is, is a direct translation of Vietnam. Nam means five. You know, you count Mo Khai Ba Bong Nam. But it's also an honor of my five siblings. Because my journey throughout my whole life, we've always been one, the five of us, you know. And it's also an honor of my dad's five and a half years of incarceration. And in and our five days at sea, of our five months in the refugee camp. But also Number five in numerology means making choices that leads to change, that leads to freedom. So it, it embodies our refugee journey. But in biblical context, it equates to grace. That ties to my personal journey. 
uh, of I, I believe it's only by the grace of God I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here today with the business. But knowing that my journey is, is kind of unique, I guess you can say, um, how do I now provide the same opportunities for someone else to do so? I don't have the capital to start a business, but I was fortunate to work at one of the largest ad agencies in the world that had good 401k, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I literally pulled out of with my, with my savings uh, to start, to start the business, uh, with the concept of how I learned growing up, the amount of money you have in your pockets is what you spend, you know, and this is what I want to do with it. Do I have enough money to get this place? Do I have enough money to get coffee over here? Do I have enough money to get merchandise, to get cups, to get this, to hire at least one person, uh, to do it. And I figure it out as I go, like you said. But I've really been thankful for the people that are around me and surrounded me uh, to support me. Without my friends like Spencer from Triple Crown Restaurant, I wouldn't be able to do this. You know, I, 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 he taught me and, and, and I saw what he's doing with his restaurant. Man, from a, lo a lot of the little nuances that takes to be a business owner. And I was able to do that and I was just so thankful, you know. Um, for that guidance to get to where I'm at, because you can't do this on your own. You literally can't do this on your own. Yep. I can't. But, it's do like, this but I remember we were talking the one time, and you were saying people you people said to you something the fact that they invest in in humans, not the business, and you were surprised in a way. I was yeah. surprised that you were surprised that yeah. people were responding like they when when people meet you, they can't help but want to invest in you because of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was surprised that you were surprised about that. No, I was, you know, I think because for the longest time, I've always held on to the fact of my past, yeah. you know, that I was almost a burden of a, of a past that's, that's regretful. And it's not something I put in the forefront of someone else viewing me in a positive light because of that. Right. So <laughs> it, it was, it's hard to say someone would want to and put their capital or investment in that, in me. But it's not who I I am. And the whole person, is, that's not, it's part of me. Right, but that but that's important. And, and look, there's going to be people who are going to judge you and define you by a piece of you. And yeah. let's be honest, it's, it's not a great part, but there are going to be people, and, and I can see because I see who's around you, um, who are going to judge you and invest in the totality of you and what you've become. Yeah. Um, and so, and those are the people who are going to be around you and they're going to help you. But, um, you know, listen, judging by what I've seen, you don't need a whole hell of a lot of help because you're a machine. Um, <laughs> but I do want to, but, but I, I do, I, I want to put out the message. So, as it relates to Chicago Peace, uh, what does help look like? If someone's listening and they go, I got to go do something with Tuan Chicago Peace, what does help look like in very specific yeah. terms? I think specific term, we are seeking uh, for mentors too. You know, you don't have to be a professional. I think you have to have a heart to want to walk alongside uh, another human being in guidance and leaning your talents. Um, the second thing I, I think we, we are, are looking for to fill, you know, positions, you know, of, of staffing. Um, I'm technically, I'm, yeah, the executive director, but I don't know how to be an executive director. Uh, it just, there's no one else right now, you know, uh, to do it. And I, I am, I am fine with, um, uh, having someone else fill that role. So now, you know, because of that, we have our programming and then we need our staffing. It's why we, we are seeking to raise funds. We're seeking to raise funds. Uh, we have borrowed space right now, right? Now we actually lost that borrowed space, so we don't even have a space to operate. So it's it's rallying folks in different locations. So I, I'm, I'm ra we're raising funds to um, have a space, you know, uh, to, to build programming, uh, to continue the mission, and to properly have a foothold 
in the city of Chicago and continue to serve our families uh, in this city uh, generationally. So it, it makes total sense, and you know we'll talk more about that. But I would encourage those who are listening to reach out to Tuan um, and talk about what you can bring to the table for Chicago Peace. Um, and even more important than that, swing by Viet Fair Five and have a coffee and talk to him in person. So yeah, where, where's so. the coffee shop? What's so the address? Yeah, the coffee shop's located at eleven sixteen West Madison in Chicago, Illinois, in the West Loop neighborhood. Um, we are, you can't miss us. There's a white brick, um, section of, uh, there's a little strip with, uh, the fuchsia color, raspberry color vid five. And, uh, you know, or you see a red Vespa out front. I mean, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I might not be there, but so you know, the man is anyway. home. Yeah. Come on in anyway. Um, it's, you know, we, uh, one of the magazines dub us to be the first authentic Vietnamese coffee shop, you know, from farm to, to table. Um, I, I, I can't, I can't claim that cause I don't know, but we, we literally, uh, are from plant to sip, you know, that's, that's our motto. That's our coffee. And it's our story to share. Um, I don't ever convince people to drink our coffee. I don't, I don't ever want to say that it's the best cup of coffee, but I know it's good, but really we just have a story to share. We really have a mission, a mission and a purpose um, in, in this city and hopefully on a broader scale uh, one day. But it's it starts with our story and our journey. And we want to bring people along uh, on that journey and build community at the same time. Look, it's it's an unbelievable um, story. And, and you know, I, I, I thought long and hard about whether I wanted to drag you back and ask you to tell the story about your past. Because quite honestly, I'm more interested in the future and today and the future and your vision for the future. Yeah. But I think it's important for people to know a little bit about it because it makes it more meaningful um, and more real. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, and I say that because like, you're a likable guy and you're an impactful, impactful guy. And I didn't know you. I didn't know your history until recent, until, honestly, until the scoop story. And Rich sent it to me. I'm like, are you shitting me? Um, <laughs> But I think it does add credibility and, and it does, it, it's inspiring in the sense of um, for those who you help can look to you as a proof point. If he can do it, then anyone can. Yeah. And, and that's powerful in the sense of using something for good, something bad for good. Um, yeah. It's incredibly generous of you to be that transparent with, with me um, and with the people who listen. Um, and, you, sir, are a saint for what you're doing, um, and I'm uh, I'm glad that we're connected. And all I would say is for those who are listening, pick up the phone or get in your car or take an Uber over to Viet Five and go and sit down with my friend Tuan and talk about how you can help with Chicago Peace because it's it's a great program, and I'll likely be there drinking next to him. So, buddy, Tuan, awesome. thanks so much for making the time. I know you got a lot going on. You thank you, Clive. People can't see, but you're actually in, in the back of the store uh, grinding it out over there. So I'm, I know you've got work to go and do, but thanks for making time, pal. I appreciate no, it. Thank you so much. Yeah, if anyone's out there, give us a follow at Bit5 and all social media platforms as well. I can't wait to see the folks in the shop. Thank Amen. you, Clive. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. This podcast was brought to you by Screen Dragon. We break down barriers, make workflow, and unlock talent. Visit ScreenDragon.com to see our software in action.